same as uh, for Daniela's talk, but then it will be uh, quite different. So uh, just to, as a reminder, a Steiner triple system uh, on a set of size n is a set of triples so that if you have two triples, uh, they only intersect in one point and every pair is contained in exactly uh, one of these triples. Okay, and uh, so here's an example of a uh, triple system of order seven. Uh, and what's also useful to keep in mind is that you can, of course, always think of a Steiner triple system as a triangle decomposition of the complete graph on um, n vertices. Okay, so uh, again, as Daniela said, uh, Steiner triple system of order n exists if and only if n is congruent to 1 or 3 modulo 6, uh, which in her terminology was if and only if the complete graph on n vertices is triangle divisible. And I'll call such n's admissible. Okay, so we know that these things exist, and what this talk will be about is uh, can we actually find such, thi such triple systems with nice properties? And what is nice properties for us? Well, the, mo the motivational result uh, is actually a, a classical result of Erdős on graphs, which says that there exist graphs, as you all know, which have large chromatic number, but locally they have very small chromatic number, <coughs> or locally they are sparse. So if you look at a small set of vertices, such graphs induce just a forest. And can you emulate something like this uh, for Steiner triple systems? So could we have a conjecture which says, or a result which says, uh, if we have a large and admissible n, can we find a Steiner triple system which is locally sparse? And locally sparse for us will mean that if you look at any small set of points, there will be few triples on this set of points. Okay, so what does few and small actually mean? So let's come to that. So I'll introduce a JL configuration is a set of L triples on J points so that if you look at two triples, they again intersect in only one point at most. So a JL configuration is a partial Steiner triple system. So just that you don't mix up J and L, I'll write it here. Um, so this is the number of points and L is the number of triples. Okay, so what kind of configurations can we expect and which ones can we forbid? Well, let's start sort of with the very simplest configuration. You always, any Steiner triple system contains a 5-2 configuration. Why is that? Take any point and it's going to live in several triples. Well, let's just take two of them and that's five points and two triples. So this is something we can't avoid a 5-2 configuration. Now you can easily generalize this to see that you can't avoid, instead of 5-2, you go up um, j plus 3j. And maybe a slightly bigger picture, uh, why does that follow? Well, you start off with a 5-2 configuration. Now, on these five points, there are two, triple, uh, two points, or there is a pair, which doesn't lie in a triple. But the whole thing is a Steiner triple system, so this lives inside a Steiner triple system, so somewhere there is a triple which covers these two points. So now we've gone up by one point and one triple. So now we have a 6-3 uh, configuration, but then now we have a pair 
which doesn't lie in a triple, so, but it has to lie in a triple somewhere, so um, there has to be a point outside which extends this to a triple, so we have a 7-4 configuration, then 8-5 and so on. So this is something we cannot avoid. And then the natural conjecture is, well, um, if we can't avoid this, uh, can we avoid anything that is denser than this? So that's the conjecture. So we can avoid J plus 2J. And accordingly, let's call the Steiner triple system K sparse if it doesn't contain any J plus 2J configuration for any J up to K. So you're, if you're 5 sparse, then you um, forbid these uh, 4, 2, 5, 3, uh, but nothing further up. Okay, so the conjecture is for any k, there's an nk, so that for any admissible n bigger than nk, there is a k-sparse Steiner triple system of that order. Okay. So, um, how should you think about this conjecture? Well, you think about it in terms of the forbidden configurations. So, well, for k equals 4 and 5, it doesn't actually do anything, the conjecture, because there are no 4-2 configurations. 4-2 would mean 4 points and 2 triples. And there, similarly, there's no 5-3 configuration. So the first time the conjecture does more than Kirkman's theorem is that k equals... Oh, k is actually this here. So k equals 2 and 3 doesn't do anything. k equals 4 um, forbids this configuration on six points with four triples, which is called the Pash configuration. Okay, so that's what the conjecture says for k equals four. You have Steiner triple systems where you never find this. For five, you get two additional configurations, which have a special name. And then for each further j, you get at least one more configuration um, which is forbidden. So these are the only two kind of exceptional values where nothing happens. Okay, so this is what the conjecture really says. You have Steiner triple systems with forbidden configurations. And what do we know? Well, in a long sequence of papers by various teams of authors, uh, the conjecture was proved for k equals 4. So there are Pash-free Steiner triple systems for any admissible large enough n. For 5 and 6, you can find them for infinitely many orders, but for 7, not a single one is known. And the tools up to this point here are mainly algebraic, based on symmetries and so on. Uh, what can you say with probabilistic methods? Well, there's an early result in this direction which says, OK, I can get k-sparse systems, which is good. They don't have these forbidden configurations in. But they're not Steiner triple systems. They're only partial systems. So they don't cover all the pairs. Actually, the number of triples they contain is some constant times n squared, where this constant, the bigger you make k, tends to zero. And remember the um, number of triples you'd really like to have to prove the Erdős conjecture is, well, this is the number of edges, pairs you need to cover. Each triple covers this many, so you have roughly n squared over six triples. <coughs> Okay, so they asked, well, can we at least bound away this CK away from zero as CK um, goes to infinity? And this was also asked by David Ellis and Nati Lineal independently. Okay, so that was the status until recently. And the result I want to talk about is that we can prove the Erdős conjecture approximately. So we can find a Stein, an almost Steiner triple system 
which is k-sparse. So the number of triples we find is almost as large as in a full Steiner triple system, and it's k-sparse, uh, and so the number of uncovered pairs is only a negligible fraction of the total number of pairs. Okay, and this, of course, answers this previous question on the previous slide in a very strong form. It says we can find this CK, essentially we can put it as 1 over 6. And that's as large as you can make it. Okay, and um, the proof, uh, I would say, is very nice in the sense that it's a very natural way of constructing this triple system is we construct it greedily in a random greedy process where we add triangles or triples one by one, um, always keeping the current sp system sparse and always keeping it as a Steiner system. Okay, so when Daniela announced the uh, results a couple of months ago, um, Lutz Warnke told us that uh, he and Tom Bormann had also been working on the problem uh, and said they proved this result, but at that stage they hadn't reached the writing up stage yet, um, so I'm not entirely sure um, what will happen in that respect. Okay, so now I'll say something more about the proof. So I already said how this is how we're going to construct this system. So we start off with an empty uh, system. Then we take a random triangle and add it. And then we keep adding random triangles as long as they're edge disjoint from the current set that we've found. So this keeps it as a Steiner, partial Steiner system. And we do not could create a forbidden configuration. So if k equals 4, we don't add it if it creates a Pash configuration. Okay, and without this second condition, this is actually a well-known or famous, a well-studied problem, which is called the triangle removal process. So uh, let me just make a one-slide detour on this triangle removal Can process. Why adding triangles is called triangle removal? <laughs> yes, that's up here. <laughs> um, there's kind of dual way of yeah, thinking yeah. about it. Uh, so classically, the way Bolobash and Erdős asked it is you start with a complete graph, you remove a random triangle of the complete graph and then again you c keep removing triangles randomly chosen uh, which are edge disjoint from the triangles you've already chosen. So then this process itself tri terminates with a triangle free graph and that's the reason they were interested in this, because they thought this might shed li some light on the Ramsey number R3T. Uh, the reason it's interesting for us is the triangles, the, the kind of rubbish for the process, is what's what we are interested in, um, is you're know, building a partial Steiner system. Okay, so uh, they conjectured it ru should run very well, um, ending with N over 3 to the 3 over 2 uncovered edges and there were a large number of papers on this uh, <coughs> and the record is due Bormann, Fries and Lubetsky uh, who got almost the right exponent. Okay, and an alternative sort of dual description is uh, which is the one which is the way th we think about it is as a kind of uh, random greedy diamond free process where you um, you build starting with the empty three uniform hypergraph you add triples uh, as long as they're edge disjoint with current triples and if you would create a diamond like this uh, you forbid uh, this triple here okay so now we go back to our process. Uh, so this is the process, and we will mostly think about it in terms of this dual uh, description where we add edges 
avoiding diamonds and dense configurations like the Pash configurations. Okay, so what we want to show is that this process should run for n squared over 6 steps, essentially. Okay, and for that to happen, we need to know that the num set of available triples is always empty, non-empty in the range we're interested in. And what does available mean? Well, a triple is available um, if it wasn't chosen before and it doesn't form a diamond <coughs> with something you've chosen and it doesn't form uh, a dense configuration. if it creates no diamond and no dense configuration. Okay, so we have to study this, uh, this set. Well, how does it behave? Well, that's the challenge somehow. Uh, before we to go to the challenge, uh, some notation which sort of f um, tells you some easy properties about the process so if we think of this in terms of steps, where in each step we add a triple, and C of I is the set of chosen triples, well, in I steps then we've chosen I triples. Uh, that's obvious. Now if we think of the set of uncovered edges at step I, well, in each step we cover <coughs> three edges, so you can write the set of uncovered edges as p, I, p of i times n choose 2, where p of i starts off being 1, so everything is uncovered, and then it gr decreases, so the number of uncovered edges uh, goes down appropriately. It would be useful to keep p of i somewhere. So p of i <coughs> is equal to... 1 minus uh, 3i divided by n choose 2. So that's the probability of being uncovered. Somehow that's the way you should think about it. Okay, but this trivial definition doesn't tell us anything about the set of available triples. Okay, so let's have a slightly closer look. Um, let's write this set of available triples in terms of the number of available triples containing a fixed edge at step i. So if you've covered the edge, then nothing is available there. So then this number is zero. Okay, but for the others, you can write the set of available triples or its cardinality as you look at all uncovered edges and see how many triples live, available triples live on that edge. And then you divide by three because the triple covers three edges. Okay, and this is the central variable that we really uh, want to track during the process. Okay, so, well, how could we do that? Well, this is the variable we're interested in. And if we want to track it, we want to first, as a heuristic, think about how does it, how do you expect it to go down? Well, it can only go down um, in a single step during the process. Well, for that, what you do is you fix. So you now have a, your edge, E you have a fixed triple containing this edge. <coughs> and you want to know what's the probability that this triple is no longer available in the next step. And what will happen is you will choose a random triple T star somewhere. Uh, and 
in this picture, then choosing this T star won't affect probably or whether T is available or not in the next step. But if, for instance, if you select T star here, then T won't be available anymore. Okay. And this is a threatening situation. So there are two types of threats. If the random T star that we choose shares an edge with T, then T is no longer going to be available. That's this picture. Well, you may not be able to see it, but um, uh, that's the way I said it. This is like in the triangle removal process. And now in our Erdős process, uh, T is also becoming unavailable if together they form what we call a dangerous configuration, which might result in a PASH configuration, for instance. I'll define that formally in the next slide. So basically the probability that you become unavailable is the number of threatening T stars uh, divided by the whole set of available triples. Uh, when you say dangerous instead of forbidden... That's I the next picture. Okay. Um, so we need to work out the number of threatening uh, triples that you could select. And here's the picture. So let's suppose we just forbid the PASH configuration. And all these four things form the PASH configuration. And the T that we're, tr uh, that we're interested in which is currently still available, is this one here. Now, let's suppose you've already chosen these two blue triples. And now look at this T prime, the red one, which is currently available. If, in step I, you choose the red one, then T becomes unavailable because it would close a PASH configuration. So dangerous is one step before PASH, kind of. Mm -hmm. So if you choose your random thing in T star being this red one, then this T gets kicked out, out of the available set. Okay, so um, how many of these are there? Well, um, you can do a back of the envelope calculation and just suppose that everything was completely random so far. So the blue triples are completely randomly chosen, uniformly at random, independently, and so the red ones are independently, randomly chosen. So everything is completely random. So how many of these dangerous configurations do you expect? So the expected number of dangerous uh, configurations... Well, T is fixed, so there are three free points, so that's N cubed. Now, the number of red um, triples is the number of available triples, so the probability of choosing them is the number of available triples divided by N choose 3, or N cubed. And you can do the same thing for the chosen ones. The size of the set of the chosen triples is, um, is i. And the probability of choosing one of them is i over n cubed. And this dangerous configuration needs two of them, so we square it. So that's what you'd expect. And if you actually do the... Um, don't care if you actually care about the constants, this number is exactly what you will get. This is the number of threatening uh, T primes um, that you don't want to choose. Okay. And now you can do the same thing for... So this was the, for the effect from forbidding the PASH configuration. And then there's a similar effect from forbidding um, pairs which intersect in an edge. And if you do this calculation, um, you can get an expected decrease in the number of triples containing the edge E. 
And for this, we assume, well, actually, the edge E itself doesn't really matter. Um, it's the process will behave the same for every E, so we can approximate the number of triples containing E by some function f, which doesn't depend on E. And similarly, um, this calculation on the number of threats um, from the PASH configuration um, is valid for any available T, so it doesn't depend on T. Then you can plug in these numbers here. Um, that's the number of available T's containing E, What's the probability that it's no longer available? Well, that's the number of threats divided by um, the number of available triples. So the number of summands is f. And then you get this effect from the forbidding the PASH configuration and this effect from being a Steiner system. And then this is a discrete change, expected change. And then you turn this into a differential equation by assuming the whole thing is continuous. So you replace the left-hand side by a derivative and you get a differential equation which is so simple uh, that I can almost solve it. Well, so you can write down the solution. And this is a heuristic for what you expect to happen. The number of triples containing an edge behaves like this p squared times n times this correction factor for forbidding the triple uh, the PASH configuration. So in the classical triangle removal process, you get a single similar thing, but it's without this red contribution here. So it starts off with you having n triples on an edge, and then it goes down. Okay. So this was just forbidding the PASH configuration. Um, you can, in general, if you forbid more configurations, you also get a correction term times this, uh, what you'd expect from the triangle removal process. And this correction term, the crucial thing is that it's bounded for all the number of steps that we're interested in. So in our case, it was I the exponent was i cubed divided by n to the 6, so this expression is a bounded size number. So the correction term uh, just take care, takes care of the variance, the fact that the numbers are not on, on the mean? No, the correction term actually tells you that right at the start, when i equals 0, mm -hmm. this is 1. So the forbidding the Prash configuration doesn't actually have any effect. Now, if i equals n to the uh, n squared divided by 12, you're halfway. Then this configuration, t uh, this correction term tells you, compared to the triangle removal process, the number of available triples on an edge is just 1% of it, what it would be in the triangle removal process. Uh, so the good news is um, that the density of available triples only drops by a constant factor, but it's still large. So the hope would be that, we already had this joke right at the beginning, um, if we divide the number of available triples by a bounded number at each stage, it won't have any effect on, on how long the process really runs, or not too much effect. The bad news is, that you can't just, so this correction term is not close to 1. So you can't ignore it. So you really need to know how many dangerous configurations are there and where are they. So that's what I mean by um, we need to track everything. And it gets even worse than that. Um, so this is the dangerous configuration that we need to track. So we need to know how many of them are there. So we call the number of this xt for t is the triple. It lives on six points and two triples which are already chosen. Now this doesn't come from nowhere. It grows. And it grows by coming from a semi-dangerous configuration which only has one blue triple. So um, we need to track how many of them 
these are there and where are they? Because they eventually turn into these semi-dangerous configurations, turn into dangerous ones. So we need to know um, everything about them. So they, these turn into dangerous ones, but they evolve from configurations which are, which are um, harmless at this point, um, which look like this. But still we know to need to know how many of them are. So you get this, if you look at the number of semi-dangerous configurations, they increase because they grow from harmless ones, and they decrease because they grow dangerous. So there's a kind of two-way, um, uh, there's a growth and a, there's a um, decrease. Okay, and at this point we were getting worried because then um, in order to track all this, these things interfere because, um, for instance, you don't want to double count um, double, uh, dangerous configurations living, uh, making some tea um, bad or something like that. And if you want to avoid double counting, that means you look at pairs of dangerous and semi-dangerous configurations. So we thought if we have to track those, then each thing we need to track, there are two additional leads, things we need to track to track that. So we get a sort of infinite binary tree of things we have to track. Um, but the good news is that um, at this point, uh, the information we need about these things we need to track gets much less precise. Um, and so we can actually stop at um, tracking um, pairs of dangerous configurations. But that was kind of the main challenge of the proof, somehow finding the right thing to track and being able to stop um, tracking an ever more bigger thing, um, uh, <coughs> a set of random variables. So what is it that makes this growth process it's a bit, bit difficult for the, uh, for the talk. Well, basically, you could think of it as a variance calculation. So you, these are the, you need precise control in the expectations. We need concentration about expectations of these. So in some sense, it's enough to have um, the order of magnitude of the variance of um, pairs of these. OK. So. That's all I wanted to say um, about uh, this proof. I hope I got across that somehow the challenge uh, was that um, these additional forbidding configurations um, made things difficult because they really have a significant ef effect, but it's not overwhelming. And because it isn't overwhelming, you s the process can still work. So is it conceivable that you can bring in an absorber method to Okay, so that's the final bullet on the final slide, where um, if you say if it's conceivable, um, then the answer is yes, but we don't know how to do it. Um, to you have to wait for the last no, no, the um, To answer this question is, well, so here we have an approximate decomposition um, into a sparse system. Now, the thing is, you could think of perhaps getting a sparse absorber as well. Uh, I can but if you... But if you... But if you put two sparse things together, even if they're edge disjoint, um, they are no longer sparse. Uh, so that doesn't work... Um, Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do next is, um, so this was all about Steiner triple systems. So what about general Steiner systems? So just to repeat the notation, a partial NQR Steiner system, so the ground set is size n, you look at the Q subsets, and you want that every R subset is contained in what most one Q subset. And it's a Steiner system if every R subset is covered. Okay, so we know they exist. Uh, can we find sparse ones? Well, um, for this we need to go back to these JL configurations. 
um, and look at what's forced and what could we hope to forbid. So a JL configuration again is we have J vertices, um, LQ sets this time, and they form a partial uh, Steiner system. Okay, so um, here's what we can't avoid. So let's define this function kappa. And this ca function kappa generalizes the Steiner triple system function, as we will see. And our proposition says, if you have a Steiner system, then it contains a J kappa configuration. So just check. Uh, if we put look at Steiner triple system, then we have R kappa 3, 2 here, and that means we subtract 3, so it's a JJ minus 3 configuration. Uh, and in general, the proof is the same, that we can't avoid these. If we start out with inductively with some configuration, there's going to be an R set in there which is not covered. But if the whole thing lives, the configuration lives in a Steiner system, then this R set lives in a Q set. So if we add Q minus R vertices to the existing configuration, we've added Q minus R points and one tr Q set. And this is exactly what this function does. It grows like 1 over Q minus R at each if you increase j by 1. Okay, so um, we could blindly conjecture um, this far-reaching generalization of the Erdős conjecture uh, that um, if we add a plus 1 here, then <coughs> these configurations you can avoid. Okay, so this conjecture generalizes the Erdős conjecture, so it's very hard. Um, so this is natural evidence for it. Um, we have a little more evidence for this, uh, in the sense that it's very easy to prove that if you, instead of putting a plus one here, put a plus two here, then it's almost true. So here's a result which says then we can ap get an approximate Steiner system uh, in the sense that it's almost a Steiner system in terms of the number of triples it contains. But there's no plus two configuration in here. Um, and so just to way to think about it, uh, if you're interested in, in forbidding the Pash configuration, this tells you nothing um, because Pash configuration would be a plus one, but it would forbid some configurations, anything. Um, okay, and the proof is very nice and easy. Uh, namely, you take the set of all Q sets. And now you select each of these with some probability P. And if you make your P small enough, then the resulting system is going to be sparse in the sense um, that if you look at a fixed J set, it won't contain or induce too many Q sets. So if you make P small enough, this will so surely happen. On the other hand, if you make P large enough, every R set will live in many Q sets. And if on the other hand, you, don't, you make... Um, well, also what you will get is that you have a nice co-degree condition in the sense that every pair of R sets lives in not too many Q sets. So you can get some <coughs> such a set, a random set, um, via this probabilistic experiment, via the Lovas local lemma. And now, because of condition B, you can apply the Rödel nibble to this set that you've found. And this will give you an approximate Steiner system. It will automatically be sparse because before you applied the riddle nibble, it was already sparse. <coughs> and sparse in the sense um, that uh, you don't contain too many Q sets. And too many was this plus two. If you put a, try a plus one here, 
then no P will satisfy both these conditions. No sparse if you can. Um. Okay. So that's the um, proof of that. And to conclude the main part of the talk, here, here are some open problems. You can think about the Erdős conjecture involved some nk. So how, how large do you need to make n compared to k um, so that the conjecture should hold? And Lefman, Phelps, and Rödel showed that it essentially n has to be at least exponential in k. Okay, you can try to regenerate our result on this random process to general Steiner systems. You can try and show that the leftover of the process is smaller than what we proved. So we proved that the leftover of the process is, well, I've got the wrong pen now, um, would be something like little o of n squared. And could you try to show that the leftover is n to the 7 over 4 or something, or even n to the 3 over 2. And the last question I already discussed. So, as the final part of my talk, I want to discuss a different way of getting Steiner system with nice properties. And here the nice property is, well, Let's suppose there are some triples that I really love and I want to have them in my Steiner triple system. And so I select them and the question is, can I then still build a Steiner triple system which contains these? And a conjecture of Nash-Williams implies you can do this if the ones you selected build a graph which has maximum degree at most n over 4. It's formulated uh, in the complement in the sense that if you have a large triangle divisible graph whose minimum degree is three quarters, um, then you have a triangle decomposition. Clearly implies this statement here. And it's best possible because of this extremal example here. So you have a blow up of a four cycle, four cliques, four complete bipartite graphs in here. This graph has minimum degree three quarters, well, almost. But the triangles always look like this. And in particular, each triangle has at least one edge or even more inside a clique. So for every partial Steiner triple system or sh partial triangle decomposition, it will use at least a third of the edges inside the cliques. But if you look at this graph here and count the edges, then less than a third of the edges lie inside the cliques. So you will never cover all the outside edges um, with triangles. Okay. So that's a beautiful conjecture, but it's still um, open. And it also motivates a much more general problem. Uh, you can ask this instead of triangles for any graph or hypergraph as Daniela discussed um, and this gives you the notion of the decomposition threshold where Nash-Williams conjecture would imply that the decomposition threshold of a triangle is three quarters and Gustafsson conjectured um, that you can generalize this to cliques in a natural way and until recently not much was known about these conjectures uh, but there's, so what do you know if a con what do you do if a conjecture is hard? You make it simpler. So you look at a fractional decomposition problem. And so in a fractional decomposition, instead of saying, yes, a triangle is in or out, you say you give triangles weight, and all you need is instead of covering each edge by exactly one triangle, you require that the sum of the weights containing an edge equals 1. Okay. And so, 
Hopefully I'll only need four. And then I offered Daniela one, but she didn't <laughs> need it in the end. Um, so this K4 has a fractional triangle decomposition like this, but it's not even triangle divisible. Okay, and here you can say, um, you can define the fractional decomposition threshold, and then you can say much more. So the lower bound we're shooting for is actually the same as in the uh, traditional decomposition threshold, but suddenly you can say that the fractional decomposition of a threshold of a triangle is 9 tenth, and Montgomery very recently showed um, that up to sort of, in some sense, the got the right order of magnitude um, for this uh, term, how far you're away from one. Okay. Um, and one additional motivation for this is then uh, that we could show that for cliques, the fractional decomposition threshold um, is exactly the same as the decomposition threshold. Uh, for general Fs, the picture is more complicated, so we got this upper bound. Uh, surprisingly, for bipartite F, where the Touran problem is so hard, um, we were able to determine the decomposition threshold for exactly for any bipartite graph. So you give me a bipartite graph, I can tell you what the threshold is. It's either um, a half or two, two, zero, two thirds. And the proof of these results is based on iterative absorption. And so these results, um, I would say, interesting in themselves. But of course, you can combine them with these fractional results to get actual numbers. OK, and um, as the very final uh, topic in this direction, again about completions, is what if we look at apartheid version of this problem? And an additional motivation for apartheid version of this problem is um, Latin squares. So there's a conjecture by Daquid and Hequist um, which says that if you have a Latin square, and you've used every number. Maybe I will actually use the last minute. Um, every row and every column exactly once, uh, at most n over four times, so it's not too full, then you can still complete it. And this follows from a three-partite version of the Nash-Williams conjecture. Namely, if you have a three-partite graph and one vertex class is for rows, one is for columns, and one is for the numbers, and this entry here would correspond to a triangle between row uh, three, column five, so we put a four here, row 3, column 5 here. Then any partial completion here corresponds to a triangle here, a set of triangles which are edge disjoint. So if you look at the complement, the set of empty um, cells here corresponds to a set, a graph which is triangle divisible and has large minimum degree minimum degree three quarters in the case of if you stick to n over four here. So in this sense you get um, Latin squares with where you've already can prescribe something um, already and we have three partite versions of our results um, in the sense which imply the following that if you instead of n over four put n over 25 then this conjecture holds. And the reason is that, again, we prove that the fractional version of this conje um, conjecture is equivalent to the actual version. So it suffices to prove the fractional version. And then you prove um, that a fractional result um, where you show that um, a minimum degree of 24 over 25 times n suffices. So if you prove better fractional results,
for this three-partite version of the Nash-Williams conjecture, you can get better results here. And we can generalize this to um, mutually orthogonal Latin squares, which correspond to clique decompositions of larger order. Okay, so thanks very much. You actually run three seconds over time. I assume the n over 4 comes from the example of the uh, yes. Um, so um, the example here has a similar flavor. Uh, obviously, it's can't, you can't take the same example. No, I'm just asking where, where the number n over 4 came, because you've got an Ye example yeah, that can't so be completed if it's the entire. Yeah, so then if you look at the, the n over 4, um, comes from the Nash-Williams conjecture where the minimum degree is 3 quarters, um, the example I had is obviously n um, doesn't f quite f this doesn't fit this three-partite setting, but you uh, can actually define um, a three-partite graph which has a similar flavor as this. Any questions? Okay, so thank you. Our next talk is in eight.